Um, I am speaking to you from Austin, Texas. And, you know, I, I feel a little bit insignificant compared to, um, you know, what we just saw because I'm, you know, I'm, I'm really a, a, I'm an art photographer. I, I don't have any, uh, you know, really any, um, you know, I, I feel like maybe my photography could possibly mean more if I, uh, you know, based on what we, what we just saw. But, um, you know, I have been doing street photography for the most part. And this presentation is, is going to lead up to the book that I came out with a few years ago. It was called uh, Fair Witness. And um, I'll get to it in a little bit later, but I have to say that I had the honor of meeting some of the, the most significant photographers of, the, of, the, of, the, of recent history, um, including Elliot Erwitt, who was a big fan of my work and, and participated in the, the production of my book, Fair Witness. Um, you know, I'm, as I said, I'm speaking to you from Austin. Uh, photography is in some ways kind of faded for me as far as a focus. Um, I, over the last few years, have become more interested in filmmaking, uh, screenwriting. Uh, I'm working on a uh, feature length script right now. It's called Tiny Texas uh, that is actually uh, begun very, 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 very early pre-production. And I, I hope that perhaps it will appear, uh, you know, we'll actually be able to make it. Uh, this was a short film that I made back in 2017. And as you can see from all the laurels, uh, it did pretty well. It was in 17 different film festivals and I'm pretty proud of that. And uh, this is uh, representative of really kind of the direction I think that my, my career as an artist is, is headed. Um, and this is my most recent film, uh, particularly germane to what we're talking about today. It was a short documentary film that I did on Gary Winogrand. Uh, you know, he was one of the most significant, pho significant photographers of the previous century. And he lived in Austin for a period of time. And I did a short documentary on his life during those days. Um, but I just want to kind of begin back at the beginning for me. Um, you know, back in my high school and college days, I aspired to be a photographer in those days. I really was interested in doing sports photography. I thought I envisioned myself being a, uh, uh, a staff photographer for the Detroit News or the Detroit Free Press. And what you're looking at were the tools of the trade in those days for me. Um, and I would photograph in the backyard and that was a neighbor kid. I was not much older than this kid when this picture was taken. Uh, and, you know, I just looked at, looked at being a photographer as a teenager, wanting to pursue moving forward in, in that as a career. But this is a picture of my father and my two, my two sisters. And my father had other ideas for me, actually, um, I, going into engineering. Um, so... But I did get to do some sports photography. That was my hero, Al Kaline, taken in Tiger Stadium, probably in the late 60s. Um, and at that time, you know, I didn't really know what fine art photography was. And I went back in later years and, and looked at my, the stuff that I had created as a kid. And I realized that I actually had done a photo series as a teenager in high school. And I really, you know, looking back on it now, I had no idea what I was doing, that I was actually documenting something. And, you know, there's this particular photograph. I, I entitled it as a 17-year-old, checking his rod. And I guess I didn't really realize the sexual connotations of that. And I got ribbed mercilessly for the title of that film, uh, uh, photograph. But, you know, I pursued this and it was... You know, I'm actually kind of proud of it. And this was a, a pier in Florida, in Clearwater, where my family would vacation. And uh, it eventually became this on the wall in, in my, much later in my life. And I, because I, because I actually did realize that, you know, I had actually done a, a piece of art, a photo series as a teenager in high school. And 
at the time I had no idea. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the transition from photographer and dovetailing into fine art, how did, you know, how did that happen for you and how did you notice that? Or is it just organic for you? Well, you know, I'm, I, I, I came to it, I came to art in photography really, really late. Um, as I mentioned, my photographer, my, my, my father had different idea and a different idea for my life than I did. And, and he said I was going to be an engineer. And so I went off to Michigan State. This is a photograph of me in my dorm um, at Michigan State. Uh, I'm sure I'm studying some computer science stuff right now or in, at that moment. And I didn't come to photography until something like 30 years after this moment. Uh, I went off and programmed computers for, for many years um, and eventually came to photography in, you know, in my 50s. But even in, in the day, you know, when I was in college, I still aspired to be a sports photographer. So, and, and the world was very different in those days. I mean, I sat on the floor at a Big Ten basketball game where this picture was taken and where that picture was taken, and no one said a word to me about it. Um, and this is what, this is really what I thought I wanted to do. And some of you may re recognize Bjorn Borg. This was when he was still an amateur, I think. And so I would photograph, uh, uh this particular tennis match between Bjorn and Rod Laver, um, you know, thinking this is where I was going to go with my life. And, and w was that, was that an ongoing issue for you and your dad? You know, was that, was there like, you know, bickering about it or? You know, well, did you just look at it as something frivolous? Yeah, I mean, that's is what I'm getting into right now with a lot, what I call the lost decades. Uh, I went off to be an engineer. I mean, I went off and had a job programming computers at Texas Instruments back in the late 60s and early 70s. Uh, I'm sorry, the late 70s and early 80s. I started my own business called Serengeti Systems, which even to this day, 30 years, 33 years later is still in existence. And, you know, I, I went off and, and did what my dad wanted me to do. You know, I got the corporate job and, you know, got the four door car and, and lived the life of a, of a young businessman or, prof or a technical professional back in the seventies. And then in the late eighties, I formed my own business, which is what this logo is Serengeti system. So I still, you know, I barely touched the camera through the, 70s and the 80s and the 90s and it wasn't until the early 2000s that i realized that you know i didn't have to program computers anymore and i had what you know could be considered a rebirth mm -hmm. and i uh bought a, like a digilux 2 camera which you can see here um that's all i could afford at the time i was trying to recreate my my grandfather's m3 which is I mean, for the people in the audience that know what a Leica is, I mean, it's a very special thing. And, and getting the, the, di the, the Digilux began my rebirth as uh, an art photographer. And this was the first photograph that I ever had published. Um, it was published in um, Shutterbug magazine. And this is actually a picture, ironic, maybe no, maybe it's not ironic, maybe it's, uh, 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 I don't know, poetic, it's poetic, but this was taken in the Czech Republic um, on one of my trips to uh, uh, to Prague, and then I went out. I can't pronounce the name of the city where this was taken, but um, this was the first photograph that I that I ever had published in a magazine. And so I began to do more photo projects um, as I began to realize my my life as as an artist. And I went out and did something I call the November Project, where I went out. Uh, in Austin and took one frame of film a day in different places in Austin. And at the end of a month, I was going to take those one frame that each a frame from each day bet for good or for better or worse and produce a book, which is what I did. And, and how old are you then, David? 54. So this was in the early, in the early two thousands. I had been a, really literally had not picked up a camera seriously for 30 years before I started taking, taking these photographs. And I went to, on one of my European trips, I went to a 
a city in Croatia called Vukovar and did a short series about uh, photographing what I thought was the beauty of destruction, which was uh, uh, in the war-torn city of, of Vukovar, which was still many years later uh, half destroyed from the war that took place in, in Yugoslavia in, in the 90s. And I was just mesmerized by the, um, the beauty and destruction, as I call it, um, in that city and produced a series of work. Um, uh, it was turned into a book by a publisher in, in Great Britain. And was, I'm particularly proud of that. And so, it, so, at some, so at some point, David, it, you had to feel like you've been asleep for 30 years. As a, as certainly as an artist, I was asleep. Right. I mean, and how come you had all those old images? You know, the, um, the Borg shots and, you know, everything else from Little League. And you know, uh, did you always look at them? I never looked at them, but I, I still have a, uh, I, I kept all my negatives. I kept all my 35 millimeter slides from those days. Uh, you know, I've got hundreds and hundreds of slides from uh, my, my, my dorm days at Michigan State that I think probably should be turned into a book mm -hmm. uh, just because it documents a slice of the 70s, you know, with, with college kids. And, you know, perhaps I'll, I'll get to that at some point in time, but, um, you know, I just, I just kept it. I, I, I never really knew whether I would return to it one day or not, but. Um, you did know, you have anyone motivating you? You know, a wife, a brother, a, a, you know, ch a son, daughter? Nope, nope, nope. I'm I I am perpetually single. Um, you know, I've lived on my own by myself for my entire life. Wow. Um, you know, you know when I was working, you know, I had support from from my from the people that ran my business or, or worked in my business who are still there actually almost twenty years later. And um, I came back from a trip to Europe in two thousand and six, and said, I don't want to program computers anymore. You know, I want to go off and, and uh, pick up where maybe where I left off as a 19 year old. And as I showed earlier, I bought a Leica camera, which made me think of my grandfather. And I went out and started photographing the streets in Austin. And, you know, lo and behold, I realized that, I mean, it took a while, but I realized that by golly, I'm a street photographer. And you know, I've done a few other things, like this was a series that I did. I'm gonna to get to my street photography here in a bit, but um, this was a series I did in color. I'm 99% a black and white photographer, but I did a series with a Diana camera, uh, which I thought was a lot of fun. It's really, really low tech. So this is, these are all film photographs. And I thought this was pretty funny. This is in Giddings, Texas. You want to go to a restaurant that serves fresh donuts and seafood. That's, that's right where I want to go. Um, and so I did, I've done a series of books. The one mm -hmm. at the bottom is the one that I'm getting to. Um, the others are self-published books that I just did over a period of time. Uh, the one on the left is what came out of that, what I, ref what I call the November project where I went out and took one for, with an M3 camera, um, uh, with Ilford 50 film, I took one frame a day for 30 days, and that became 30 photographs in that book. Um, so Fair Witness is the only one that really amounted to anything, but these other others were self-published books that I had that I had done. And so, th few things that I've done. Uh, ACP was something I created in Austin, the Austin Center for Photography. Um, you know, sadly, it didn't survive me leaving it, but it was something that I hoped would be like the Southwest version of ICP, you know, the great center that's, that's in New York City. But sadly, uh, uh, it, it, it didn't survive and it, it, it no longer exists, but we had some amazing photographers come to Austin. That's how I come to know um, Elliot Irwood and Alex Soth and Dale, David Allen Harvey and Eli Reed and and others who came to in, inspire my work and and there's Elliot right there. Um, he was here 
to speak to an Austin audience. And we went to the Austin Museum of Art. We were given these little stickers. And I don't, you know, some of you may know of Elliot and the type of, type of man that he is and the type of photography that he does. But the fact that he stuck the Amoa sticker on his forehead and let me take his picture is very indicative of who Elliot is. And I, it's a, an enormous honor to have known him and to have him and to, and to know that he appreciated and liked my work and participated in the creation of my book. And for the, for the, you may not know Elliot, I wanted to show a few of my favorite pictures that Elliot did. Um, he's pretty famous for his dog pictures and the humor that's in his photographs. And this is a photograph of Eli Reed. Uh, I met him in a similar way and he became a, a, a supporter of mine and my book came into being because Eli actually sent me a, an email at one point and said, Dave, it's time for you to do a book. And Eli is in, is in Magnum and uh, is uh, a world-class photographer. These are a few of his photographs that, that I, really, I really appreciate. And so before I get into showing you my photographs from Fair Witness, I, I think this is an, an interesting exercise. I like to go through that, in my opinion, as an art photographer, um, what is it that makes a photograph? And so I'm gonna go through a few examples of what I think makes a photograph and to entertain you while I'm going through it, the image on the left-hand side are pictures from my book that I called Piss, which are a series of urinals that I urinated in across Europe. Uh, there must be 60 different photographs or urinals that I urinated in, in Europe. And I didn't know I was gonna make a series of photographs, a book out of them, but I did. You never know what, where, taking pictures are going to lead you. Um, so I, I think that something that makes, makes her a photograph, and I'm thinking primarily of fine art photographs here, um, is, is content. What, what is in the photograph? And you know, this is a, a, is a famous photograph. And it, the content of this is mind boggling. And this was taken by Sebastio Salgado and I mean, just look at that, the, the flames and, and so forth. I mean, it's, there, it, this, this photograph is so rich with the content that it's presenting to us as a viewer. Um, and the next thing that I think makes, a, makes this important in a photograph is, is, is the composition of the photograph. And some of you may recognize this. This is a, a photograph that I don't particularly care for, but at the time, and it may still be, this was the most expensive photograph ever sold. Um, and Andres Gursky took this and you know, I think it was pretty seriously photoshopped, which kind of diminishes it in my opinion, but people, somebody paid a million dollars for that photograph and you have to admit the composition is stunning. And then there's also, especially in black and white photography is texture and this is a famous photograph that, that Robert Frank took and the texture of the brick and the texture of the fabric in the, uh, in the, in the shirts, uh, in, the, in, in the coat of the person on the right-hand side. Um, you can, it's almost something that you can feel as you, as you look at this image. And, and, I, and I try to, these are all heroes of mine. I try to mimic and in, in, uh, in, uh, channel these things into my own photography. And then this, there's also depth. And this is a photograph that by probably one of my greatest heroes outside of Elliot Erwitt uh, is um, Gary Winogrand. And as I, you saw earlier, I did a short documentary about Gary. And you know, the depth in this is astonishing. And this is one of his, one of his most significant photographs. And you know, it, it, something starts at the bottom of the frame and goes all the way to the back of the frame. And so there's, there's a profound sense of depth uh, and, and, and in this case, a profound sense of width in this photograph that Gary did. And then I like to think each of my photographs tells a little story. Um, and it's almost a movie in, in, in a single frame. And, you know, some of you may recognize this. I mean, it's just an amazing pho photograph that Deanna Arbus did. And there's a whole story behind how she ended up with this photograph. And this pre precocious little kid 
not wanting to be take, having his picture taken and resisting and resisting. And this is him actually saying, stop taking pictures of me. And Deanne took it. And this is just, you know, it gives me goose pimples to look at this, this, this picture that is just, it's just, <laughs> it's just, it's just great. And there's also, I hope in my photographs and other photographs, uh, a, a, a sense of mystery. What is the photographer trying to convey? Uh, what is the message in the photographs? And this is another one of Gary's photographs. What are all these people talking about? Where are they looking? What is going on in this particular moment that Gary was so brilliant in, in capturing? Uh, and this was something, a photograph he took at, at the World Fair, at the World's Fair, I think in 63 in New York. And it's just, it's just, what the heck is going on? And I, I just think it's, I just think it's wonderful. And then I think is your, as a photographer, whether you're doing documentary photography, as we saw earlier, or doing um, fine art photography, there's, you have to bring a passion to it. And it's the passion of, of, of the photographer, and you have to be passionate about the subject matter. And some of you may recognize Gordon Park's work. And I actually have two photographs of his because he was passionate about civil rights and, and, and wanting to, to uh, uh, document the experience of, of black people in America back in, back in, the, back in the 60s. And, and, and Gordon was, um, was, was an amazing photographer. And I think he probably had a great inspiration on my friend Eli and, and the work that he did. Um, so I think that um, you, you have to be passionate about the subject matter of, of the work that you're doing. Um, and then finally, I, I really think we need to have fun as we're doing it. Um, enjoy it as a photographer, but also uh, see the fun and in, in the, in the humor in the world. And, and nobody does it better than Elliot. And this is one of my favorite pictures and I laugh every time I see it. Um, you know, it's just like, I, want, I, I was surprised to find out that this photograph was taken in the United States. I really thought that it was taken in Great Britain, but um, anyway, uh, you want to have fun when you do it, and hopefully, you can convey humor in in your work, uh, in the, in the work. So that, that then that brings me to my work, um, brings me to my book, Fair Witness, which is a book of street photography that I took over uh, the middle aughts, you know, from 2006 up till around 2010. And it was inspired by, by um, Eli Reed. You know, he told me, Dave, it's time for you to do a book. And when a photographer of, a, of Eli's caliber tells you time, it's time for you to do, to do a book, uh, you know, it's, I had to listen to Eli. And I had some of the, the, the greats help me with this. Elliot Irwin helped me with this. Mary Ellen Mark wrote uh, a part of, uh, helped me with this and did part of the, um, uh, uh, gave me a dedication. Um, and I just, so I did the Kickstarter and managed to raise $26,000 to publish this book. And for those of you out there that may want to do a book, um, that wasn't enough. It, it ended up costing me a whole lot more than that. But um, I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of, of, of what Fair Witness came to be. And there's a little bit of a backstory in how the title came about. Uh, a fair witness is a character type in a famous um, science fiction novel Robert Heinlein wrote in the 60, in the 60s called Stranger in a Strange Land that I happened to be reading at the, at the time. And um, so in collaboration with Eli, when he saw this particular photograph that you can see, um, we, we kind of made a, a little bit of a science fiction theme to, to the book. And... Uh, I'm a fair witness, not a participant, which made sense to me as a street photographer. I'm, I'm documenting what I see. I am not participating in what I see. So if you know the story of Stranger in a Strange Land and what a fair witness is, I, in some respects, was behaving as a fair witness through the series of photographs that I'm going to show you now. And what I'm going to do, I don't know, where are we time-wise? Okay, I'm doing that. Am, am I... I'm not doing bad time-wise. Um, 
I learned a long time ago from another photographer who I admire, uh, Richard Calvar, who gave a presentation of his work that I saw in Germany back right when I was thinking of becoming a photographer. Um, he taught me that the photographs must speak for themselves, which means that he is going to show you his photography and he is not going to talk about his photography. He's going to, and so he just cycled through a series of his photographs without saying a word about it. And so that's what I'm going to do. And I think in the, in the, for the sake of time, that's the best thing to do at this point. So I'm going to cycle through the photographs that are in my book. Um, you know, show you each, you know, most of them for a short period of time. And, and then, you know, if we have questions or want to talk about it at the end, uh, that'll be fine. But, um, these were photographs that, that were in my book, Fair Witness. So like I said, I'm going to shut up and just, uh, cycle through them slowly. I hope you enjoy. That's Alex Soft, by the way. So David, how long a process, are, I mean, how, from beginning to end, how old are some of these shots? Uh, they cover a period of about five years. Wow, okay. From 2000 and Four, I think, might be the earliest one, uh, up until around 2009, 2010. Okay. And I had a lot of help from Elliot um, and Eli in, in uh, selecting these and in sequencing them. Uh, I sat in Elliot's studio on two different occasions going through work prints and asking him, to sort them as an A, B, or C. And, you know, A's were great pictures, B's were maybes, and C's were maybe not so good. So that was, that was the, the, the series that I did uh, of Fair Witness. Uh, what followed that was another series that I called Look at Me, which was a portrait series that I did in New York and, and a few other places where I would approach um, young men on the street and ask them if they would meet me at some point in the future to participate in a portrait project. And this is me at a museum in, in, in Washington, DC with pretty much, well, not the, not the complete collection. I had um, about 130 different uh, portraits take, uh, that I took in this uh, and this particular exhi exhibition, I think, had 36 prints, and they were all taken with a very specific style. And I think you'll see the style as I as I go through them.
So the, the look at me was, uh, I, I don't ever do um, portrait uh, style photographs. Everything I take, 100% since 2006, are landscape, which is like what you see here. And so with look at me, I was trying to figure out how could I do a portrait series and, and, and in the landscape format. And so I would ask somebody to pose, look directly into the camera, think about something, try to beam me some sort of message about themselves. And at the same time, I would seek out a background that I thought would look really great out of focus and use a 50 millimeter lens on my Leica and focus on the eyes and uh, come up with uh, what I thought was a pretty compelling and a pretty emotional series of, um, of photographs. And, you know, that's me. <laughs> That's, I actually didn't, I actually have never used an Instamatic, or at least not recently, but I thought that photograph was, was pretty cool. And I do something, and I did something for seven years. And if you look at the top of the screen, it's something that I call my paw, or picture a, picture a week. And I would publish a new photograph on my website every week, and I did that for almost eight years. Okay. Uh, when I got into filmmaking, I kind of, it kind of went on hiatus, but I'm doing it again. So this is my website and this is what my most recent paw is. Um, well, I should back up and um, you're welcome to join. And I'll have my website pop up in a minute. Um, you're welcome to come and sign up for my paws, uh, but it's a way for me to show my work on a regular basis. In this particular case, this photograph, as you can see, was taken six years ago. Um, in the times of COVID, it's difficult to do street photography. I'm not really doing much new work. Um, so it's an opportunity for me to mine my archive. And that was taken in Washington Square Park in New York six years ago. Um, I have to say, David, you sort of lulled us together, lulled us to sleep there when you, started, you said you weren't going to talk about your book and showing all those images. That, that work is really incredible. That well, is just beautiful, beautiful work. I mean, my well, God. That's, uh, I mean, I, you know, I, I, I like to, you know, I mean, I, mean, I, I, I'm, I try to, I'm, I'm, I'm a modest person. I don't toot my own horn very much. But I, I have to say, though, if, if Elliot Erwitt, and some of you in the audience may know who Elliot is, some of you may not. I think everybody but, does. But, you know, for him to think that I'm a good photographer, and for him to allow me to sit in his studio on more than one occasion, and for him to look at my work and lend his name to my book, um, it says a lot. And also Mary Ellen Mark and Eli Reed and David Allen Harvey and, and uh, um, uh, oh, I, the names are escaping me right now, but they all supported me. And so if they are my only audience for my work, that's, that's fine. Um, you know, I tried to sell my book, you know, I, it was on Amazon for a while. It was at, uh, Strand Books in New York for a while. Um, but it's really, 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 really hard to rise above the noise level these days and become somebody as a photographer. Um, so that's fine. And, and so I did the book and that's when I went off and started becoming more interested in filmmaking. And now I maybe even have a fourth career. Uh, recently, I've become pretty passionate about Polaroid SX-70 cameras. And I didn't show any of my SX-70 photographs, but I have a couple of inventions coming out for the SX-70 here in the, in the near future, which is gonna be, be kind of exciting. And um, so this is my website and my email. So if you're interested in my work, if you want to get on my on my on my picture a week list, uh, there's a place on the, my website there to um, to sign up. And you know, I you know, I wondered what I was going to talk about today because I because I'm less of a photographer now than I was four years ago or five years ago. You know, I, I think of myself more as a filmmaker now and and a screenwriter. And but I mean. Thank you, Frank, for pointing that out. I mean, I think I, I am a pretty fucking good photographer. And, um, 
it's nice to have this opportunity to kind of go back in time and share some of this with you and with the other people that are online with us. And, um, you know, maybe one day those pictures that I took of my college buddies in my dorm at Michigan State, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, of color slides will become another book, you know, because that is a slice of time that's lost forever. Yeah, and, me, somebody put up a question. Did you ever think of, be, um, of trying to become a member of Magnum? You know, I actually, I fantasize about that at one point in time, especially when uh, I got to know Eli and, and, and I began to realize that maybe my work was pretty good. Mm. But, you know, Magnum is not what they used to be. And I sometimes think that if I was doing this kind of work back when I went off to college and became an engineer, Maybe I could have been another Gary, another Gary Winogrand or a Lee Friedlander or, um, I mean, there are curators who use my name in the same sentence with same sentence as Robert Frank, you wow. know, and holy sh fucking shit. You know, that's like, really? Uh, maybe I could have been seen as one of those people, but I came to it too late. Let me and, ask you this. Did yeah. you ever, um, bad, the bad way to phrase it, you ever make peace with your dad with photography or did he ever oh, yeah. come to love it? you know, and, and see your vision? Did he ever regret not pushing you earlier on? My dad died really before my photography was resurrected. Mm. But I know that he was proud of me. And, um, and, and I'm proud of what I accomplished as an engineer. I mean, I formed a business in 1986 that is still around today, you know, 34 years later. And it is still providing an income to a half a dozen people and and I still draw a little bit of money out of it, but I don't really have anything to do with it anymore. Uh, it's all, it's in the, in the, in the hands of, of the people that run, actually run the business. Any regrets, David? Should I start it earlier? Uh, the, I mean, my, my, my biggest regret and is not related to photography or art. My biggest regret, is that when the seventh grade basketball coach came up and asked me if I wanted to play basketball, I said, no, because mm -hmm. I'm pretty tall. You can't tell by looking at me here, but I'm almost six foot six. And, um, and I was tall as a seventh grader and, you know, I, but I was a, I was a, I was a coward as a child, as a kid, I was afraid mm -hmm. of everything. And when I got into middle school or as it was called junior high in Michigan, uh, I'd, I'd never seen that. I'd never seen the game played. So that's your only regret. My only regret, honestly, my only regret is I did not say yes to that basketball coach mm. that might have allowed me to be. I played a lot of basketball in my life. I love it. Um, maybe I could have played high school ball. Maybe I could have played college ball. Um, I don't so, know. Another but, question: Do you yeah. sell your work privately or at a gallery or commissions? Uh, I, I appreciate the question. My, my dream was always to be in galleries and to have people want to collect my work. Um, but like I said, I think I came to it too late. You know, by the time I... I got to tell you, Gary, uh, Gary, that, I tell you, uh, they, you know, for someone who had this journey, I don't know how you could utter the words, it's too late. No, I mean, I don't mean this. I think I came to it if I if I had come to this 30 years earlier and I was kind of, I could be lumped in. I mean, people surely buy Elliot Erwitt's work and Eli's work because, you know, they've been around forever. They have a name. Mm. But to break in at age 55, you know, in the, in the early, in the late 2000s, break into the gallery game, you know, and to play the gallery game, street photography is passe. You know, I mean, I think that, it's oh boy, you get a lot of people yelling that. at you, David. I'm sorry. You're gonna get a lot of people yelling at you, telling, saying that street uh, photography is dead. Oh, I, I, I would knock somebody down with if they said that because I don't believe that. Okay. But the, but the art world is oh, okay. art world sees it that way, and there's, it's like, you know, who are you? We got all these great Gary Winogrand prints to sell. We got all these great Elliot Erwitt prints to sell. We don't need you, and I, I, I I'm not, and that. Don't get me wrong. I have no regrets. You know, right. I'm glad I did my book. I'm glad I know those people. And 
I'm thrilled to be doing films now. I mean, this, some of you, I don't know if you know who that guy is, but that's, um, that's Eller Coltrane. That's the boy in boyhood. You know, I've known him since he was 15 years old and he played the lead in my short film and he's going to play a part in what I hope will be uh, that, this film. Yeah. And, and, uh, you ever so reach out to curators, David? I'm sorry, go ahead. Have you ever reached out to curators? Yes. But, you know, it's been a while. I reached out some time ago and um, I, 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 Frank, I got no traction. Yeah, okay. If you, know, if you know some curators and you can turn them on to me. You need a rep. I always say that. That's, that would be great. And, um, but, I mean, I, I, I really appreciate this opportunity to talk. I mean. Yeah, thank you, David. Uh, and I hope that, that my work maybe is seen. I have one good friend who uh, uh, worked for the Peter Fetterman Gallery in L.A. Uh, he's now off doing his own thing. And Doug has my entire archive on a hard drive. Mm -hmm. So if he wants to do a, um, um, uh, oh shit. A retrospective? No, yeah, but who was the woman whose work was discovered? Oh, uh, um, out of Chicago. Out of Chicago. Someone okay. will say it in the chat room in a second. Okay, I hate it when, I, when I'm on the spot. Count to three. Vivian Meyer. Vivian Meyer. If, if Doug wants to do a Vivian Meyer with me, okay, if he can make money off me after I die, I love Doug. Go for it, man. Mm. But, maybe uh, before you die. Maybe, maybe before, before I die. Money. But, but, David, I cannot tell you how much we appreciate you uh, shedding some skin and showing us your work. You're a, uh, you're a wonderful secret that uh, we feel like we've all um, sort of discovered. So I cannot thank you enough it's for, my, uh, for coming in. It's an in. honor and privilege to be here, and, and I'm really grateful for you asking me to uh, be a part of this. Yep, no, that's... Um...